All right, guys. Marcek from Tok is here. He will talk about what if spring disappeared for a week. So apocalyptic scenario for you. Uh, of course, like uh, each uh, other talk, the Q&A session will be taken outside behind this stage on the Heap Space booth. So make sure to not miss Maciek's uh, uh, appearance here. Maciek, do you plan on walking to the airport like you did in Bucharest or will you be taking the old school yeah, cab? Maybe I'll, maybe this time I'll take a bus. I mean, at least I know where does it go from, like from Zeleni Venac. 72 or something like that. Indeed, so I know how to, how, how to go. Yeah, back you just to the go airport. down Zeleny Venice, not up. You'll see. <laughs> I've did that last year. The floor year. is yours. I did that last Thanks. year, two years ago, three years ago. Yeah, I've been to, I think I've been to all uh, Vox Day's Belgrade conferences. And today I'm going to talk to you about what to do when spring disappears. Of course, spring disappeared like three months ago and for half a year but we'll be talking about a bit different springs. So, well, at first let me introduce myself. So as I've said, I've been to Vox Belgrade for the last three years. And I still work at small software house based in Warsaw called Tog. And we do, we're, well, in fact, we're not so small, almost 100 people. And we do various things. I'm working for last two or three years on kind of open source project called Tog Nusnaker. I've been talking about it like last year and two years ago. It's based on Scala, stream processing, Flink, and so on. I'm really proud of it. If you want to have stickers with that, come to me after, after the talk. <sighs> but I did a talk about it like last year and almost two years ago at HipCon, so I cannot talk about it again. So I decided to talk about Spring, and you may wonder, okay, so if you are doing stream processing, Scala, what do you have to do with Spring? And the thing is, I, well, I've been, user of Spring for kind of almost 12 years. I remember like in 2006, when the world was young, I've been introduced to Spring, I think one dot something when I was in Finland back then. And it was so great experience. I felt so liberated. No more XMLs. Oh, some XMLs, no more EJBs, annotations, unit testing and so on. Life was great. And for quite a few years, I've been using Spring in various projects. A lot of things changed, right? Annotations came, auto configuration, then Spring Boot. And like almost five years ago, I started using more, more of a Scala than Spring. So I dropped out a little bit. I just overslapped this Spring Boot revolution, Spring Cloud and so on and so forth. But I've noticed that more and more uh, young developers coming to our company, because I do quite a few job interviews, I just associate, I don't know, enterprise applications in Java only with Spring. Just like if you have uh, Ruby developers, then it's Rails developer, and you have Java developer, it's Spring developer. So this puzzled me a little bit because I knew that, well, <laughs> there is life in Java without Spring. And then when I was thinking about subject for my title, I noticed a tweet of my good old friend Milan. I hope you uh, made it to his talk yesterday. It was really good. So. He tweeted, sometimes I wish I had the power to make the whole Spring stack disappear for a week. Sit down and watch half of, half of the young Java developers would run around and cry, what would I do? How do I write this app? And this resonated with me because I could come up, come up with a few examples when exactly this happened. Some time ago, I was writing this kind of integration platform. It was based on Cara, FSGI, and various kind of more enterprise technologies. So we didn't want to use Spring. And I had to kind of onboard some of the developers to write services for that and, and so on. And a few of them were talking, OK, but then there's no Spring. How do I enable this feature? I can't put annotation. And I said, OK, so you'll write these two lines of code and here a line of configuration. Yeah, but with Spring, I would do it with one annotation. Why well, cannot do this? I cannot do this. But it's just a line of code. Come on, relax. But I want Spring. I want Spring. I want to enable everything with one annotation, right? And, and at that point, I just, I had to admit I, I got a bit angry on him, but still. And another similar example comes from, uh, so they could do literally anything they could do with Spring Framework, but just in a bit different way. 
And now, a few months ago, we've been involved in a project when, for various reasons, our client thought about uh, forbidding us to use any external libraries outside kind of core Java. So my friend who was assi uh, assigned to that project just asked me, OK, so how do you do it? Well, Michal, if you don't have Spring MVC, you can use serverless. They still exist. But will I have to use all this XML with serverless mapping, serverless definitions? Like, like I, I was young, he's kind of old. OK, as old as me. And I said, OK, Michal, but you know, uh, quite a few years ago, Servlet 3.0 came, and you can use annotation with Servlet. And he said, eh, what? It really happened? I didn't know about it, because Spring covered every, everything that's below from him, right? So he didn't even know that quite a few years ago, these annotations were introduced to Servlet framework. And the last kind of example of, of situation when maybe you don't want to use Spring, it's, uh, well, surprisingly job interview. One of my friends has this, his kind of favorite question on job interview. How would you implement simple proxy for routing requests with additional header? Just to see if a person has kind of DevOps mindset. And he told me, I don't know what's the correct answer, but I know what is not the correct answer. And the not correct answer is to say, I would just bootstrap a string, spring application and do this proxy forwarding there. Okay, so from time to time, you have to leave spring stack and try something different. And this is what we are going to try here, because, you know, here at the conference, we're kind of in a safe environment. Well, I may be in less safe because I'm on stage, but we don't have to care. This is kind of how it looks like outage in, in one of major Polish retailers. So we don't have to worry too bit. Now we can, in, we can have safe environment and think how to replace Spring if we were to use some, well, kind of random generic microservices, exposing some APIs, connecting to database. Oh. My God, you can't see the arrows. Something's wrong with the display. So there are gray arrows. Don't worry about them. Uh, yeah, exposing some APIs, connecting to database, external services, and also doing something with configuration. So what now? We don't know. If we cannot use the fact the standard, that is Spring, maybe we should start to try with kind of not de facto, but normal standards made by standardization committees. So I won't be talking about Jakarta E, JE, JE Guardians, whatever you call it right now, because I'm lost track. Is it now in Oracle? Is it now in Eclipse? How do you call it? And so on. But I want you, uh, but I want to point you to some other standards dealing for. Uh, dealing with enabling us to, to, to write nice microservice applications. And one of them is MicroProfile. How many of you have been to Emily's talk yesterday? Ah, oh, some of you. This is good, so I don't have to repeat myself that much. Because MicroProfile is kind of an effort le led by Eclipse Foundation and some large vendors like Oracle, IBM, JBoss, and stuff like that. And they came up, came up with quite a few nice API. Some of them are probably well known to you, like CDI, JSNP, JAXRS. Some a little bit less, like APIs for injecting configuration, defining check, health checks, metrics, and so on and so forth. So this is all the part of kind of thing that's called micro profile. And the idea is that these are small, simple annotation-based APIs, just like you have in Spring, where you can develop microservices. And they really try to imitate Spring in, in many ways. Like, for example, there's this Wildfly Swarm project that has even a Spring initializer, just like Spring initializer project generator. So you can pick dependencies, click, and Maven projects are generated. But unfortunately, I did this screenshot like a few months ago for last edition of my project. And now I wanted to go back to that. And. It turned out that Wildfly Swarm is gone. The project doesn't exist. Instead, there's the thing called JBoss Porntail, which is kind of new, 
JBoss implementation of MicroProfile. So everything is not really stable. Of course, apart from JBoss implementation, you have also others like Open Liberty. I'm sure that Emily shown you uh, yesterday that it's really capable and a nice feature. And just a few weeks ago, another implementation by Oracle, <sighs> kinds of, I don't recall how is it called, Heli, Helix or something like that. That's kind of new, mm, new project from Oracle. I know probably at this point you don't trust Oracle, but the project is really nice, open source, so give it a try. So there are quite a few implementations. There's a lot of mm, kind of flux inside, so I'm not sure if everything is kind of really ready for prime time, especially when it comes to examples, documentation, but my profile seems to be quite interesting. I wouldn't be, of course, myself if I hadn't, when it comes to standards and microservices, if I didn't mention OSGI. I'm sure you've been to Milan Stocks, so you know almost everything about SGI, but be assured that there's kind of a large stack of projects, Apache Care, Fire, Ops 4J, that allow you to build any, any enterprise application you, you need with SGI. You have all these, uh, all these things like JTI, JPI, CDI, whatever you want. And you can do virtually anything. You have even have a project called Apache Car of Boot that aims you to provide that aims to provide you with with some nice starters to, to, to generate the project. And now I don't have too much time for a real demo, so I prepared just just a short video how it uh, how it looks like. So let's have a look. Now Look closely because this is the climax of the presentation. Oh, sh yeah, this is it. So we packaged our car of application and now watch closely. Do you see that? This is the power of Spring Boot, right? Give the creators of car of a round of applause and I'll show you once more. Right, so this is, you can, you can do ASCII art, so this is really Spring Boot. But, of course, now life is not only roses, because SGI, this is great technology. You should be acquainted with it, at least just a little bit. But it also has some kind of darker sides and, yeah, and bad fame. Unfortunately, this is another tweet, not from just a random guy. If you know him, this is Mario Fusco, who is Java champion, so not just random dev moaning about SGI. OSGI has its, its, its own problems, but they are mostly not based on, on the problems with the API of the programming model, but with communication, documentation, samples, and stuff like that. So you, cannot, you, you can use it, and it will work, but be prepared to read a little bit of code and not only great spring tutorials. So what I want you to remember when it comes to all those fancy standards is that, okay, probably they are not as fancy as Spring, at least uh, sometimes, but please remember that probably your Java application need not be as fancy as it gets when you, when you watch some, I don't know, Spring Beautiful presentations by Josh Long or something like that. Probably you don't need many fancy things and you can safely get along either with MicroProfile or OSGI. But still, you may ask, okay, so the standards will do, but they are still kind of <laughs> imitation of Spring programming model. So why would I use them in normal circumstances when I can have the original? And you'll be right. I hope that in, in some kind of near future, they'll catch up and they'll be as good documented as, as production ready as Spring, but I think it'll take some time. Okay, but if not standards, what can we do? We have to look for something else. Ah, we have to start to decompose Spring Framework. And to do that, we have to answer to the question, what is a framework, right? Spring, Spring is a framework. And I want to recall to you, I'm sure many of you know the distinction, the distinction between framework and library. Because Spring is a framework, just like, I don't know, Rails, Django, stuff like that, which means that it takes care kind of of architecture of uh, your application, of wiring, opinionated cho 
it has opinionated choice of libraries and so on. And you just plug your code here and there, either business logic, exposing some uh, APIs or connecting to external services like database. But on the other hand, there's kind of another programming model, not so opinionated. When you, you, the developers, decide how you bootstrap your application, how you create the components, how you wire them together, and then you only use kind of smaller libraries like scissors here and like some tools here and there. One for exposing APIs, one for connecting to database and so on. But it's your decision, it's your responsibility to wire everything together. So we tried with this approach. Now let's look at the other. So there's Majestic Spring Framework. Of course, it has a lot more of more of components, like I picked only a few of those because the rest wouldn't fit my slides. But at its core, well, surprisingly, there's Spring Core. And what is especially Spring Core? Well, this is where the magic happens, and this is the glorious IOC container, right? It manifests itself in your application through annotations like component auto wire and stuff like that. Some you may think, so. Can I really get rid of that? But a few months ago, I overheard some conversation at my, at my job. Uh, these were, this was done, of course, by Scala developers saying, Spring, like it's, it's just like a big hash map, isn't it? Which is kind of true, right? All this IOC container is a big hash map for, uh, for your beans. And of course, hash map is magical data structure. If you don't believe me, just uh, take a look uh, into the code. But you may think, OK, maybe this IOC container is not so magical if it's hash map. And the other thing that may pop up in your head is like, do I really want to have this big hash map at the core, at the heart of my application? Now I, I can be a little bit controversial, so I resort to citing a lot of authorities. Be prepared. And the first one is Tomer Gabel. He's a great developer from former weeks, now I don't know where he's based. If you have a uh, chance to listen to him, do. And he said in one of his talks, if you're seeing benefit from IOC container, your code base is already out of control. So this may seem a bit provocative, because we all know that for all projects that are not toy projects, you need IOC container. You just cannot wire dependencies together. But then, maybe he's right. Maybe if we decompose the application, just like Milan shown us yesterday, maybe the need for the IOC container would be smaller, right? So how do we approach this? And uh, there are a few presentations or talks that I want to recall you. And one is done by my good old friend, Kuban Abridalik. And it is about mid-sized building blocks of software based on packages. And if you know this guy, this is Simon Brown, who is also advocate of good decomposition and modularization of, uh, of your application. And they advocate that we should use more, far more than we, we use uh, now, uh, package scoped classes. Right? So this is package scope is the default, uh, the default modifier for Java classes, but we don't use it too often. And this is a slide again from, from my uh, friend Jacob's talk. And so he shows, OK, so this is our module. Now we wire all the package protected dependencies together by ourselves, because this is our business logic. We have to take care of it. And only we expose as public classes one facade. And then only here we use Spring, right, to inject configuration and to expose, in, expose that facade to, to everything else. But you may look at it and say, OK, but you did almost all of the job by yourself. Why do you need Spring for that? Just for two annotations when you wired all the, all the dependencies together, right? So maybe we can do also this on, on a higher level. And the another kind of architecture pattern, uh, it was talked about by my another friend, Dominic. It's called Port and Adapters. It was designed by, um, by, by Crockford, who called it hexagonal architecture. I hope many of you know what it means, but just to recall, so the idea is that we package our application, we structure it like a hexagon, and inside there's, again, there should be an arrow here, sorry about that, and inside hmm, there's our sacred business logic, 
domain logic, and we don't want too many libraries, too many framers going inside, right? That should be just plain Java code, no Spring, no, I don't know, whatever, Zipkins. And now we have just a thin layer that controls how our business logic contacts with the outer world, right? So here, by definition, we don't need Spring or any other frameworks like that. And the boundary should be thin, right? It should be simple enough uh, so that we don't want to test it, uh, make unit test out of it. We just do integration tests for that. So maybe we can do without Spring. Okay, so here are the architectures, but what do we do now? And the answer is we stop peer domain, right? Uh, a few years ago, uh, I also had the assumption that normal Java programmers programming enterprise applications should not write kind of main. We have vars, we have ers or whatever, right? Main is just for toy projects. Of course, now all Spring developers write main, but it's just, usually it's no longer than that. But in fact, we can do a little bit more here, right? We can do just normal dependency injections by ourselves with these hands, right? So we just create our data source with some configuration that we probably parse, we'll talk about in a moment. We create repository, we could create API, inject our dependencies, and, and yeah, and that's all. We wired up components, right? This is what we put into main. Does it intimidate you? Does this scare you? If our application is well divided, that will be okay, right? So the lessons mm, for me from that is that we can live with I without IOC container. And what's more, this manual dependency injection can enforce even better design because if you have a large tangled graph of dependencies, probably you want it to hurt, right? And if you do manual dependency injection, it will hurt. And the last thing, you can try it out on small scale. So we've talked about kind of general architecture of our application. Now, what do we do, for example, with data access? Right? We won't be able to use glorious spring data with generated, generated code from this nice method. I'm sure you can uh, read what it does. I'm sure we're sure that everything is okay with that. So what, what do we do without it? Well, there are a lot of options. I'm an old grumpy developer. So let's see how do we use Hibernate without Spring. Some years ago, it was really hard and intimidating. But a few months ago, I tried it out for this presentation. And OK, I had to do a few lines of XML and like five or six lines of Java to create all these Spring session factories and stuff like that. Does this scare you? Will this code make you 100% less productive? I guess not. So it's not that bad, and Hibernate got a real, uh, quite a bit better from the time that I last seen it. OK, and then, well, these things won't be auto-generated. We have to write them themselves, which is kind of boilerplate-ish. But here, we have at last at least control over our SQLs and so on, and here, well, the criteria API is a bit verbose, but at least it's composable, right? And if you don't want to use Hibernate, because it's a framework, we want to use libraries, there are a lot of other options. And I picked one, it's called JDBI. And it's a nice small library that's kind of wrapper on, on, on SQL, right? So it's not as advanced as Hibernate. You just write SQL by your hands or OK, you can generate also some classes, some implementations of your DAOs when you just define what your SQL is. But it's quite small, neat. You, don't, you can use it just from plain Java. Of course, you have to know SQL. But for data access, I think it's, it's quite OK. So you can use JBI, JDBI, you can use Hibernate. But then the dragons begin, and the dragon is transactional annotation. This is one of the greatest features of Spring that you can put this transactional annotation wherever you want. And some magic happens. And this magic, well, you have to do somehow by yourself if you want to do it. And that magic is coded in Spring in something like transaction aware data source proxy. I urge you to look at Spring code and see what it does because it's a really clever piece of code. And if you want to imitate, you would have to write a lot of code like that. But please don't look at it 
It won't work out of the box. There are a lot of tricky things. And transactional annotation is really, really interesting piece of code that you probably don't want to use by yourself. Well, that this is life. So let's, let's move on. We've talked about, about uh, access to database. What about exposing APIs via REST? So first, we, we start with some traditional, I would say, uh, frameworks or libraries, which are covered by Spring, like Jersey or Jetty. And then we do it just like a normal Spring. We, 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 write, inter uh, we, we write our endpoints. We put JAXRS annotations like get, path, query, params, and so on. So nothing, nothing exciting here. But now, as we don't have Spring, we have to wire these things together. How do we really expose it? And will it scare us? So let's try it out. We have some port, HTTP port that we want to expose, and some endpoints that we created. So this is Jersey and uh, Jetty code. So we create a server. We are wire up our endpoints. OK, probably this could be just a little bit closer, but at least you have a full control. And you say, OK, this server should handle these endpoints. And then we start server. We can join to not, not to finish our program too soon. And is this all? Well, not, of course it's not. I have to close the bracket. But now the method is complete. And we just run it. And voila, we've exposed our JAXRS APIs. Again, it doesn't look that complex. And we have control over how uh, how, how, how we can change the behavior of, uh, of our Jetty server. OK, but again, maybe you don't want JAXRS. You said, OK, annotations are bad. I don't want to use annotations. Let's try something different. And fortunately, there's a plethora of small Java libraries that enable you to, uh, to expose REST APIs in different ways. I just picked random one. It's called Threadpacks. It's not so young. It's, fine. it's pretty old. But let's see how will it perform. So again, it's no annotations this time. We use more like HTTP, if you know, Scala way. So we define a server. And we say, under this URL, I want to serve this JSON with some kind of default offer. And for, for this URL, I have to extract user ID, some kind of query parameters, path parameters, and then invoke my bean. Here, things start to look a little bit weird because this, frame, this library is, uh, puts a lot of emphasis on, on non-blocking uh, non stuff, and we have blocking APIs. But don't be too worried about that. And here you see a few lines of code again. We expose some REST APIs. Again, nothing to worry about. But. You may, of course, say, OK, so this is good for toy projects, but I have real enterprise applications. They have to be production ready. And what will you do about that? We won't have, we won't have enable auto configuration. What will we, do? will we do? How do we inject configuration? And so stuff like that. Start with configuration. In Spring, you'd probably inject configuration subjects with some various kind of well, I don't know, spell expression language that can be infinitely complex. But you can try something different. I want to point your attention to a library called TypeSafe config. This is from guys from Scala, but it's written in Java. And their config is written in some kind of almost like JSON, but look, with comments. And you can define your configuration as normal Java Beam, right? And mapping, everything will be nice and type safe. And then somewhere in your main, you parse the configuration, actually load it either from some uh, resource or, or, or from a file. And then you create your config object. It is parsed. And then you can know that it's correct. You can access every, uh, uh, every configuration properties in a in, in nice type safe way. So it's pretty neat. Go and check it out. And if you want to do some kind of implement more cross-cutting concerns. Let's have a look at this Jersey stuff. This is how we registered endpoints. Now we add un one line, and we exposed documentation via Swagger. We, w I we add another line, and we expose Zipkin tracing via some configuration. We add third line, and we registered some metric stuff. So 
Not a big deal. Maybe not annotations, but one line can get us pretty far. And for example, with health check, let's see how it looks with Ratpack, right? So a health check is basically just a provider of some information if we are okay or not okay. Healthy, unhealthy. And then we create this object, this health check, and somewhere in Ratpack configuration, we define, okay, this is where I expose my health check, and these are the health check I want to observe, right? So again, the idea of health check is pretty obvious. It's quite easy to implement them themselves. Okay, so we are slowly, slowly running out of time, so time for a crap. But you may also wonder why I'm not talking to you about cloud, Netflix, and stuff like that. So the first thing is we're running out of time. The second thing is I'm not feeling an expert, and the landscape is changing pretty fast. For example, the Ribbon project is, I thought it was kind of hype, but now I've seen it's on maintenance because Netflix said, okay, we're doing something else, nothing to see here. But uh, you have been here to Aaron Gupsta's keynote yesterday. So he told us that probably in near future, we won't be using client libraries inside our applications to communicate, to, to, to have uh, things like circuit breaking, routing, and so on. We have sidecar proxies for that which means that we don't have to worry if our client applications inside Java applications have all those fancy things. They will be handled by Envoy proxy written in C++. So let's finish up. So this is the second part of the conversation. <laughs> so our friend Neil Barlett said, I think they would say, oh wait, I really needed, I, re I never really needed half of that shit. He's SGI guy, so he's a little bit biased, but in fact, he's right. The question is, which one, which half is which? And we, we may see that, okay, so we view Spring as kind of monolithic framework, but you can also see that there are a lot of, lot of components, and most are wrappers around some different libraries. And sometimes Spring has kind of thick layer, gives a lot of value, but for many things, the layer is pretty thin, and with a few lines of code, we can have access to the libraries themselves and not rely on Spring. So these things include, for example, uh, in manual dependency injection. You can write some glue code to wire all these libraries dependencies together. And of course, you can read the docs, figure out the details. It won't hurt you, and you'll get a lot of better understanding of your code. And in fact, you can get pretty far with that approach. One of our clients, so we've developed an integration platform for them using SGI, Caraf, and sometime later, he went to microservices workshop based on Spring Cloud Stack. And afterwards, he said to me, yeah, you know, you know Magic, everything is pretty nice, but most of the stuff we already have in our platform implemented it a little bit different way without annotations and so on, but it's working. Of course, you shouldn't do everything by yourself. You shouldn't do at home. Transactional stuff, stuff dealing with threads, and by all means, security. This shouldn't be probably done by ourselves, but by dedicated libraries whose authors know better than us. But to end with some quotes, I want you to remember that probably in most of the projects, it's fine, and you will use Spring Stack, and be happy with that. But from time to time, it's good it's a good idea to try to implement something with, by yourself, without Spring, using other libraries, just, just for fun and to learn and to be ready when time comes when Spring is not around, right? Because the thing is that Spring gave us a lot of great stuff and it raised the bar high for the authors of li other libraries. But they do fall, and I find that the quality of all the libraries kind of similar to what Spring does, raised, uh, well, quite considerably in the last few years, right? So, go and check it out. And if you have any questions or you want some talk stickers, just find me around in the booth. Thank you very much. <laughs>